When we talk about old WWF versus WCW dream matches, the same names always seem to come up, mainly Goldberg versus Steve Austin and The Undertaker versus Sting. Taker versus Sting really speaks for itself. Not only were both men true cornerstones of their respective companies, but their characters and gimmicks could seriously play off each other in order to make the dream match work. It's one of those matches that people wanted really badly, but in the end, it never Ever got presented. With Goldberg vs Steve Austin, I could say this dream match comes from the fact that both men were world champions of their respective companies at around the same time, but really, a big factor in the Austin vs Goldberg discussions was centered around how similar both men looked from a presentation standpoint. The bald head, the goatee, the black trunks and the black boots. When Goldberg first showed up, I distinctly remember people calling him a Steve Austin ripoff, but as we all know, the similarities ended at the ring gear. Still, this was enough at one point to get people talking about a dream matchup between the two men. From organization cornerstones, to characters, to parallel success, to similar wrestling attires, a dream match could really get plucked out of anywhere, but there's always been something in common. There had to be some sort of similarity between the two superstars going head to head. What about move sets? What about guys who perform the same kind of moves? What about guys who perform the same finishing move? When we talk about WWF versus WCW, at one time, the company's two top babyfaces performed the same finisher. And this again was enough to get people talking about a dream match. Bret the Hitman Hart versus Sting. Now, just to get it out of the way and to clear it up before you start typing in the comments section, Bret Hart vs Sting wasn't talked about nearly as much as Taker vs Sting or Goldberg vs Austin, so there's that taken care of. For some fans though, a Bret Hart vs Sting match was once a dream matchup that made way more sense than what you may think. It's not just the sharpshooter and the scorpion deathlock here, it's also two babyfaces, two world champions, two guys who could be considered smaller in comparison to the guys they went up against in their respective company, and two men that fans had a great deal of respect for. In the early and mid 90s, fans absolutely adored Sting and Bret Hart in a much different way to, say, the way fans gravitated towards Steve Austin and Bill Goldberg. The Hitman and the Stinger were once clean cut good guys who gained admiration through their actions inside the ring. They rose to the top by doing the right thing, and young fans in particular went nuts for both men while they defended their world titles against a string of bad guys. It just so happens that both Brett and Sting put their opponents away with the same move. Brett's submission finisher was called the Sharpshooter, while the Stinger maintained the original name for the submission hold, the Scorpion Deathlock. I'll just quickly mention too that neither man came up with the move. That honor goes to Japanese legend Ricky Koshu. But Brett and Sting sure did make the hold popular. On surface level though, this was enough to get fans talking. Who pulled the move off better? Who was the better champion? Who would win in a match between WCW Sting and the WWF's Bret Hart? Well, we got the chance to see Bret Hart vs Sting on a few occasions when Bret made his way to WCW after the Montreal incident. Now, ask most people and they'll tell you that Bret didn't do much in World Championship Wrestling. That one time Goldberg speared the Hitman while Bret wore a metal plate always gets brought up. There was the Owen Hart Memorial match which deserves all the accolades it gets. There's Bret's weird on and off association with the original NWO and there's also the Stark match with Goldberg. These have been the more regular talking points of Brett's WCW career. Nobody talks about Brett's matches against the man called Sting though, even though the two men had some decent bouts. In particular, their Halloween Havoc 1998 match was pretty good. But by the end of this video, you'll clearly see why the Hart vs Sting series doesn't make it on any top 10 dream matches that actually happen lists and all that nonsense. So let's look at the times the excellence of execution stepped inside the ropes with the icon in WCW.
The first time Brett and Sting shared a ring together was when they teamed up to take on Kevin Nash and Randy Savage. This tag team match took place on the 16th of April 1998 episode of Thunder and it also took place during simpler times, at least for WCW. Brett and Sting were good guys and they were going up against two members of the original NWO, but there were also some problems brewing within the New World Order faction. Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan were at each other's throats and this match ended when Hogan and and the disciple ran in to attack the macho man. This was all slowly building towards the formation of the Wolf Pack, a splinter group within the New World Order that would feud with Hulk Hogan's original black and white NWO. At Spring Stampede a few days later, Hulk Hogan attacked his tag team partner Kevin Nash during their match with the Giant and Roddy Piper, and Kevin Nash also helped Randy Savage win the WCW Championship from Sting a little later in the night, a move that would truly tear the NWO apart seeing as Hogan felt that he should be the only heavyweight champion within the New World Order. The next night on Monday Nitro, Hulk Hogan got a title match against Randy Savage. The disciple Eric Bischoff and Kevin Nash interfered in the bout, but the story coming out of this match was the interference of Bret Hart. Bret ran down to the ring and he attacked Kevin Nash before draping Hogan over the lifeless Randy Savage. The referee counts to three and Hulk Hogan is once again the world champion. The next week, Bret wanted to speak face to face to Hollywood Hogan. Bret said that Hulk is the highest paid wrestler in the world, he's one of the most recognisable superstars ever, and Bret was about to tell Hogan why he helped him out last week but Randy Savage interrupted the promo. We I assume Brett wanted to prove a point by beating Hogan for the title, but we didn't get a clear answer. When Nitro went off the air, Brett applied the sharpshooter to Randy Savage. Keep in mind too that Brett was wearing a Hulk Hogan t-shirt while all this went down. The Wolfpack was officially formed the week after, and when this new version of the NWO had problems with WCW superstars later in the broadcast, Bret Hart ran down to the entranceway to stop Brian Adams from getting involved. The message was clear, these Wolfpack guys can fight their own battles. If you wore the red and black, then you were no longer part of the core NWO group. This all led to Randy Savage facing Bret Hart at Slamboree 98, a match that Bret Hart won via submission. Special referee Roddy Piper reversed the decision the next night on Nitro because Bret attacked Piper while his back was turned, and also because Hulk Hogan got involved. A couple of weeks later, Sting joined the NWO Wolfpack. Brett was part of the NWO Black and White vs NWO Wolfpack rivalry that went on during the summer of 98, but the hitman would confuse fans and commentators by saying he was friends with both Sting and Hollywood Hogan. On the August 24th, 98 episode of Nitro, Brett said he was stuck between a rock and a hard place. He respects Sting, and even though Hogan makes mistakes, Hart says he also respects the Hulkster. The very next week, Hogan wanted to put Brett's loyalties to the test in a tag team match, Hogan and Hart vs Sting and Lex Luger. Brett wouldn't wrestle Sting and the hitman stopped Hogan from beating Sting with his weight belt. The match ended in a countout when Brett and Hogan began arguing on the entranceway. The following week it looked like members of the NWO Black and White were about to attack Brett. The Stinger dashed to the ring to make the save and Sting then gave Brett the opportunity to hit him from behind with Sting's own baseball bat. Sting used to do this during his early crow days to see who he could really trust. Brett dropped the bat and Sting walked back up the entranceway. That same week, Bret Hart represented the NWO Black and White in the War Games match during Fall Brawl 98. Because Stevie Ray and Hogan attacked him, Bret decided to leave the NWO the following night. Bret was injured and the Hitman asked fans to forgive his actions over these last lot of months. The Hitman admits that he was playing on the wrong side with Hollywood Hogan and the NWO and Bret wants a chance to once again be a hero to wrestling fans across the world. Roddy Piper comes out and he cuts a fantastic promo telling Bret Hart that his dad would be proud of him and if the people of America could forgive Bill Clinton then they can sure forgive Bret Hart for associating himself with Hollywood Hogan. With only one good leg, Bret stopped Hogan from attacking Goldberg and Sting later in the evening so it looked like Bret was being true to his word. 
Hulk Hogan got a little too big for his boots on the September 28th episode of Nitro when he said he could take care of both Bret Hart and Sting, and the Hulkster issued a challenge to both men. Hollywood knew that Bret had a bad knee, so the Hulkster was trying to get an easy win against the excellence of execution. Bret accepted the match first, saying he's waited his entire life to destroy Hogan in a one-on-one -on -one wrestling match. On a night where Nitro defeated Raw in the ratings, which was becoming more and more rare towards the end of 98, the Hitman and the Hulkster squared off in the middle of the ring, but the match never really got underway. Bret's knee couldn't hold up, and the Wolfpack ended up coming down to get Bret out of the ring. Remembering that Hogan had challenged him to a one-on-one -on -one match, the Stinger takes off his coat and another match gets underway, this time it's Sting vs Hulk. The Stinger had the match won, we see the Stinger splash, and when Sting goes to apply the Scorpion Deathlock, Bret Hart shows up and he hits Sting with a DDT. Hulk and Bret then completely annihilate the Stinger. Bret applies the Sharpshooter for an extended period of time, Sting gets hit with a steel chair on the leg, it's complete decimation from Hart and Hogan. It was all a big setup. Bret was still a bad guy and he was still on good terms with Hulk Hogan. The next week on Nitro, Sting vs Bret Hart was booked for the main event. Sting came out first, but Bret decided to turn back and walk back up the entranceway. The hitman wanted no part of the Stinger. Sting gave chase, and what we ended up getting was one of the more memorable WCW Nitro backstage fights. Bret and Sting targeted each other's legs, there were table spots, trash can spots, the two men trying to hit each other with metal poles, though in the end Sting was able to apply the scorpion deathlock to the hitman before security ran in. Bret had done plenty of damage too though, both men hobbled away from each other as Nitro went off the air. Bret then challenged Sting to a match at Halloween Havoc 1998, a pay per view that's more remembered these days for the abysmal Hulk Hogan vs Ultimate Warrior match. Speaking of Hogan and the Warrior, the Hitman teamed up with the Hulkster to do battle with the Blade Runners on the October 12th episode of Nitro. This star studded match ended in typical WCW Nitro fashion, with an NWO run in. Sting still hadn't officially accepted Bret's challenge by the time the next Nitro aired on TV, and even though the match was booked by the creative team, WCW still decided to air a Sting vs Bret Hart match on the Nitro before Halloween Havoc. It's decisions like this that make you wonder what on earth WCW was thinking, but yeah, it is what it is. Before the match though, we did get a bit more story. Bret said that he stays up late at night thinking about all the ways he can get back at the fans who turned their back on him and there's no better way to do that than beating up Sting in the middle of the ring. The hitman then said that for years and years Sting has tried to copy Bret Hart. From Bret's own success to the sharpshooter, Sting had done everything possible to try and be the next excellence of execution. The hitman said Sting will never be the best there is, the best there was, nor the best there ever will be. And just then, Sting showed up. The bell rings and we have a match on our hands. People might have been expecting a technical and grounded match between these two, but no, that backstage fight set the tone for Sting vs Hart in 1998. These two were going to have an all out fight and there wouldn't be much wrestling. Sting applies the Scorpion Deathlock and Bret reaches the ropes. Sting tells the referee he might as well ask for help because Sting is not letting go of the hold. Officials come down to the ring, but the stinger keeps the deathlock applied, and eventually Vincent and Stevie Ray come out to break it up. Brett looked hurt, so maybe the stinger had an advantage going into Halloween Havoc. Halloween Havoc 1998 took place in the MGM Grand Garden Arena on October 25th, 1998. The Hitman vs The Icon was the third to last match. Hogan would face the Warrior immediately after this bout, while Goldberg defended the WCW Championship against Diamond Dallas Page in the main event. Mike Tenay says not to expect a wrestling clinic from these two tonight, it's going to be a fight, while Tony Schiavone speculates that the problems between these two really stems from the usage of the Scorpion and Deathlock and the Sharpshooter. They did kind of throw that in there at the last minute to be honest and it would have been nice if they built up a whole story around the finisher before the match took place but anyway. Sting comes out and he's got a goatee. His makeup kind of hid the facial hair on Nitro but here at Halloween Havoc it's fully grown and I'm not gonna lie it looks a little weird. The US title is on the line. There's a long delay before the two men get physical. Brett refuses to get in the ring and when the Hitman eventually gets inside 
tied the ropes, he runs away again. This gets a loud course of boos from the audience, but Bobby Heenan says this is a smart Bret Hart strategy. He's getting inside the head of Sting by dictating when the match is going to start. Sting has enough and he goes after Bret on the entranceway. Sting successfully takes control of things and Bobby Heenan backtracks, saying it's now Sting who is dictating the pace. The Stinger taunts Brett in between offense. Brett finally begins fighting back and he hits a DDT, the same move that confirmed Brett's allegiance to Hulk Hogan back on Nitro. The audience chants Brett sucks but it doesn't phase the hitman. Brett is now in the driver's seat and he's completely working heel here, from shouting at the referee to choking his opponent in the corner. Early on Sting is put into survival mode, Hart hits a bulldog while keeping the pressure on Sting and Sting gets a great opportunity to end the match when Brett jumps off the middle rope with his feet out. Brett's back slams to the mat and Sting goes for the scorpion deathlock, but Brett grabs the bottom rope. Sting this time lets go, he wants to win the US title of course. The Stinger mounts hard and a series of punches gets delivered. Sting shoots Brett off the ropes. The Hitman performs a leapfrog but he grabs his knee before hitting the mat. Brett seems injured. Sting wants to continue beating up the Hitman but the referee jumps in and this gives Brett the opportunity to pull some brass knucks from his tights. Yes I know they aren't brass knucks but I don't know what other way you could describe this weapon without saying it was a piece of velcro and nothing else. Sting takes out the Hitman and Brett drops the weapon. Sting picks it up. He goes to attack Hart, but the referee stops the stinger by grabbing his arm. This allows Brett to hit a low blow and from this point on, Brett goes on the attack. Brett pulls off a backbreaker, he hits the elbow from the second rope, but Sting still kicks out. Hart throws Sting out of the ring and the icon takes a beating on the entranceway. The hitman is getting vicious here and he isn't letting up. Brett gets into the ring and he attacks behind Sting's back. The referee tries to stop Brett before going to check on the stinger, but the referee ends up taking a back elbow from the icon. Just to make sure, Brett hits a leg drop on Billy Silverman. Sting then begins an all out assault on the hitman. The two go back and forth and Sting ends up delivering a superplex to the hitman. Brett lands across the referee's legs. Sting then hits the stinger splash but he completely overshoots his target, resulting in the icon smacking his head on the ring post. Ever the opportunist, Bret Hart grabs Sting's baseball bat and he proceeds to hit Sting across the back. The hitman then drives the bat into Sting's neck from the middle rope and then Brett wakes up the referee. The sharpshooter gets applied, but Sting is completely out cold. He's unable to submit, and the referee calls for the bell. Bret Hart wins via knockout. It was a good finish here in terms of protecting the sharpshooter and the scorpion deathlock. After the final bell, Brett talks a little smack to the fans at ringside while Silverman calls for some help. And before the next match begins, we see the EMTs taking Sting out of Halloween Havoc on a stretcher. I know Brett likes to say he didn't accomplish much in WCW, but surely a victory like this over WCW's franchise player must mean something. The icon took some time off after this match, and we wouldn't see Sting again until March of 1999. By the time Bret Hart and Sting met again inside the ring in a one on one capacity, the landscape of WCW had changed so much that you'd swear it was a different promotion. The Hitman vs The Icon took place on the October 18th 1999 episode of Nitro, nearly one year after their Halloween Havoc encounter. Bret was still complaining about never getting the opportunity to wrestle Hulk Hogan for the WCW title, I'm not kidding by the way. Sting interrupted the Hitman and a few things to note here, Sting was the WCW champion and Sting was also a heel, a heel that fans still cheered but a heel nonetheless. Sting said Brett should stop crying, everyone who works in the wrestling business has been screwed over one time or another but Sting is going to do something that will put a smile on the hitman's face. Sting will give Brett a WCW title shot live tonight on Nitro. The match was placed right in the middle of the broadcast, don't ask why, and there's nothing at all to complain about here, Hart and Sting had a good TV match 
match, an excellent TV match by late WCW standards. Brett out wrestled Sting during this bout and Sting had to use some dirty tactics to stay on top of the hitman, but by and large Brett once again dominated the match. Miss Elizabeth showed up and Elizabeth distracted the referee while Lex Luger jumped into the ring with a baseball bat. The hitman gets whacked on the knee and Brett taps out almost immediately after getting put in the Scorpion Deathlock. Clearly the bat had become a key factor in the Sting vs Hart matches. Would we ever see the two men finish a match in a clear and decisive manner? The following month, WCW held a tournament to crown a new WCW champion at the Mayhem pay-per-view and the hitman Bret Hart would meet Sting in the semi-finals. There was no other story going into this one, Sting was still trying to work as a heel while Bret was still determined to win the WCW championship. Not only did Sting work heel during this bout but Mayhem also took place in Toronto, Canada so it was pretty impossible for Bret to get any kind of negative reaction throughout this bout. Now, it it isn't a perfect match, there's definitely a few timing issues and it did feel like Sting was maybe a little disenchanted with WCW during this time period but it's still a good fascinating match that lets us see a full blown bad guy Sting taking on Canadian hero Bret Hart. In terms of how the match was laid out, it was good but the problem was the finish. Neither man stays in control for long and the Stinger again had to use dirty tactics to keep his advantage. The fight spilled to the outside momentarily and Sting missed a stinger splash on the table and then back inside the ring Sting grabbed the referee while the hitman came off the top rope. This gave Lex Luger and Elizabeth the opportunity to once again come down to the ring. Lex grabs the baseball bat but he doesn't hit Brett, he hits Sting. Bret takes out Luger and the referee calls for the bell, Bret Hart wins via disqualification. Bret was unhappy with how the match ended even though Sting used the referee as a human shield. Bret felt that Sting deserved another chance, there had to be a clear winner. The referee agrees to restart the match. Bret puts his spot in the Mayhem Tournament Finals on the line in order to get a decisive victory over Sting. The Hitman immediately resumes his attack. Sting gets a boot up when Hart comes off the second rope and this gives Sting the opportunity to apply the Scorpion Deathlock. Bret attacks Sting's knee while locked in the hold and the Hitman reverses the Deathlock with the Sharpshooter. Bret wins via submission in the final Hart vs Sting match we would ever see on TV. Sting calls Bret back into the ring after the bout. We think the Stinger wants more of the Hitman but the two shake hands in the middle of the ring. Sting would turn back into a babyface immediately after this match and Bret would go on to defeat Chris Benoit in the tournament finals. Bret had finally gotten what he wanted, the WCW Championship. The big problem with the Sting vs Hart matches, as you can clearly tell, is that every match had some sort of interference or some sort of cheating, and I think this is why nobody ever really talks about this series of matchups. It comes down to the NWO being the NWO in 1998. You weren't going to get clean matches during this era, and in late 1999, WCW was turning into such a big mess that nobody really cared enough to follow along. In saying that, the restarted mayhem semi-final was the closest thing we got to a clean match but even then Bret attacked Sting's weakened leg in order to get out of the Scorpion Deathlock, a leg that was weakened by Lex Luger minutes before. We never did get a pure Bret Hart vs Sting match simply because the matches took place in a messy WCW. Had the two met in the World Wrestling Federation or if Bret maybe got to WCW a little earlier then things could have been different. Some might say that when all was said and done Bret got the best of Sting but really neither man can claim to be better than the other in a kayfabe sense anyway. But at least we can still argue about who pulled off the Scorpion Deathlock or the Sharpshooter better. It's Bret Hart by the way. Thanks very much for watching and take care. Check, check.